Dr. Wheelick webcast, Manufacturing Economic Predictions for 2023, sponsored by SAGE. My name is Robert Schoenberger, and I'm Editor-in-Chief of Industry Week. Before we, we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First, if at any time you are having audio difficulties or slides are not advancing, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you are running pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable the software to view the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the question mark help button in the upper right corner to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the maximize icon in the upper right corner to enlarge the window. We welcome your questions during today's event. To submit your questions, simply type your question into the ask a question window on the left side of the screen, then hit the submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation, but please feel free to send in your questions at any time and we will add them to the queue. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Industry Week website within the next day for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. When the webinar ends, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen. I would now like to welcome today's speakers. Dr. Chad Moutre is Chief Economist for the National Association of Manufacturers and Director of the Center for Manufacturing Research uh, at the Manufacturing Institute. As an experienced Chief Economist with a demonstrated history of working in the government relations industry, Chad provides regular updates on the economy pertaining to the U.S. manufacturing sector, including regular briefings with senior NAM management, written analysis, and professional speeches. And if you're not receiving his Monday updates on Twitter and LinkedIn, you really should sign up for those. They're fantastic. Chad has worked closely with senior level economists and other leaders uh, from their member companies to gauge their views on the current state of the economy and policy as it relates to their businesses. He is highly engaged in briefing existing and prospective membership on economic trends. Chad received his PhD focused on economics from the Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Uh, Rob Sinfield is Vice President, Sage Business, uh, Business Cloud Enterprise Management. As VP, Rob brings more than 20 years experience in the enterprise space as he leads the global business unit for Sage for Sage X3 product portfolio and the Sage Intact manufacturing distribution and supply chain domains. He also manages the product management, engineering, operations, and ISV recruitment, enabling the success teams globally. Rob has worked uh, in a variety of industries ranging from manufacturing to financial services, implementing enterprise software solutions in more than 50 countries. For further information about our speakers, check out the speaker details tab in your console. Welcome, gentlemen. And with that, Chad, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. And hello, Rob. I look forward to hearing what you have to say as well. Um, start here. Uh, I'm going to stay on the title slide just for a second to kind of give a quick snapshot of what I'm seeing in the manufacturing sector. Right? It's, it's a bit of a mixed bag, quite frankly. Right? So. Uh, certainly, we've seen slowdowns in the manufacturing activities since the summer. Um, sentiment surveys, as you know, uh, are negative, right? So we've seen fractions in sentiment surveys for the last few months. Uh, and there's this kind of nagging worry out there about recession, right? And so there's that, that kind of negative news that's out there. Uh, and, and yet, uh, there is still that the chance of a soft landing, right? Um, and much of what makes that storyline the key is the labor market. We continue to see pretty solid labor market growth. Uh, this is jobs week, so we're going to be getting new jobs data later uh, later on Friday. So it's certainly a lot to watch and some, some positive news that's out there. Um, again, uh, you can follow me on Twitter and see some of the things that uh, I, I put out there on a regular basis, including consumer credit later today. So uh, I'm going to start here with this particular slide. Uh, this is the Indian Manufacturers Outlook Survey. Uh, full disclosure, this is in the field right now, and today is actually the last day for our members to respond. And so uh, hopefully we'll be releasing something very soon on the first quarter readings. Uh, but you can see here over the last 25 years, uh, roughly three quarters of our members are positive at any given time. You can see the recessions that are up there kind of highlighted uh, in gray. Uh, and I guess more importantly, what you can see from this chart uh, is that at least in December, sentiment pulled below not just the historic average, but it pulled to a two-year low, right? So again, very consistent with what you see in other, uh, in other uh, data points. Uh, and, and uh, you know, 69% of our members are positive about their company's outlook. Right now, that's down 20 percentage points from, from before, uh, from this time last year. 
Uh, and, and a large part of that overall storyline is, you know, obviously the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, and, as well as you know supply chain issues, inflation, and a number uh, a number of other challenges that are out there in the field. Uh, and so. Uh, the one comment I'll make here, kind of also on the NAM Manufacturers Outlook survey, and this I think is sometimes lost in translation, especially when folks continue to talk so much about, uh, you know, uh, the contractions that you're seeing in ISM and other, and other readings. And that is that manufacturing activity, when I go out and I talk to folks about the next 12 months, uh, yes, we've clearly seen that number slip pretty dramatically over the last year. But it's not negative, right? Uh, and, and I think, you know, I've seen some of the preliminary data for the first quarter. It's not negative in the new data either, right? So there, there's, we've seen a slowdown in overall manufacturing uh, expectations in terms of sales, production, capital spending, et cetera. Uh, um, but it, has, it, it is not, at least in my view, negative. I've been at the end of long enough to see times when it was negative, and that's not where we are right now. I, I actually would not argue that we are in a manufacturing recession now. I know that there's a temptation amongst a lot of folks to say that we are, uh, but I, I would not argue uh, that that's the case. Part of the challenge here uh, that manufacturers have is that they are having trouble finding workers. Uh, in fact, the number one issue in the December survey uh, is attracting and retaining quality workforce. Uh, everywhere I go, everyone I talk to in the manufacturing sector, small, medium, and large, says that uh, you know they're having trouble finding talent. Uh, many of them. Uh, are really scrambling for talent. They've had to raise wages several times over the last couple of years to try to find that talent. Uh, and it is just one of the bigger issues that's out there, not limited to manufacturing, quite frankly. Um, it's certainly something I hear pretty much everywhere I go. Uh, supply chain and inflation also are issues uh, towards the top of the list here as well. They have been number one at one point or, or another over the last couple of years, uh, still getting more than 60% of, of folks saying that those are primary challenges. Uh, but not the issue that they were, or, or certainly not the issue that, that um, uh, overall workforce ha has become. Uh, we have certainly seen overall supply chain issues get better at, over the last few, you know, so the last couple months or so. You're seeing a lot of trend lines that are suggesting that delivery times and freight costs and a number of other variables uh, have improved and moved in the right direction. And yet we still hear from a lot of our folks that supply chain issues uh, are, are still out there. Um, uh, it really varies from company to company, but we still hear it uh, quite often. And inflation, quite frankly, also is, is still a challenge, although that uh, uh, is, has also improved quite a bit. So I mentioned the ISM survey earlier. So this is the chart for it. This is the Institute for Supply Management's Purchasing Managers Index. Um, this pretty much every sentiment survey looks like this one. Uh, and and uh, you can see that this time last year, obviously demand, production, uh, a number of variables were still pretty solid in the economy. Uh, and then obviously February hit and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, over the summer, we really had a lot of supply chain and, and inflationary challenges. Uh, and obviously the price of gasoline, for instance, hit an all time high in, in, in June. Uh, and then you've had just kind of this nagging really since last summer notion um, that we've been trying to talk ourselves into a recession. Um, uh, you know, this morning's good, uh, a Wall Street Journal call, called it the Godot recession, which I thought was kind of creative. Uh, we've been kind of waiting for this recession for a while, and that, I think that continued discussion about that uncertainty, I think, continues to kind of plague us. Uh, in, in terms of the overall PMI itself, uh, it's been below 50, which su suggests a contraction for four straight um, months. Uh, and new orders can have, have fallen uh, over much of that time period as well, although you can see here that there was an, an improvement or at least a decline in the rate of, uh, a, a slowdown in the rate of decline in the month of, of, of February, right? So uh, I do expect that these numbers will, will hopefully improve in the coming months. We've seen other sentiment surveys that have started to rebound a little bit, at least globally. And so hopefully that's a sign that we'll start seeing better data uh, here in the US as, now, as well. But for now, uh, those have been relatively negative. The other thing to watch, and this is a number we'll be getting next week, is manufacturing production. Uh, we ended uh, 2022 on a very weak note, both in no November and December, with some pretty solid declines kind of across the board in manufacturing activity. Uh, that was followed by a nice rebound in, in January, right? Uh, we saw a weakness across the board in a number of economic variables at the end of last year, including not just manufacturing production, but also retail sales and obviously housing and other, other measures 
Uh, but we saw better data in January. Uh, part of that, um, well, I'm sure when we talk about housing or we talk about the jobs numbers, it was the warmer temperatures uh, that, that accounted for some of that. Uh, but there are also, I think, in, in my, there's a sense that, that uh, uh, globally things have improved a little bit in the last couple, couple months, uh, and, and that hopefully is a sign of it as well. Um, with that said, even with that improvement that we had, uh, you can see here what overall activity looks like uh, in terms of manufacturing production and capacity utilization over the last uh, a couple of years. And there's this sense out there that, that um, well, two things I'll, I'll say here. Number one, when I travel around and I talk to manufacturers, one, they, they, they acknowledge that we're seeing slower growth over the last uh, six, seven, eight months. But many of them, what they tell me is that, yes, you're seeing some pullbacks, but you're pulling back from a really strong base, right? We've had a pretty solid growth over the last couple of years uh, during, the part, during the pandemic. Uh, and when you look at it on a year-over-year -year basis, largely we are still seeing, you know, modest to somewhat decent growth uh, in terms of manufacturing activity. So that's something I hear anecdotally. This chart somewhat bears that out um, uh, in that if you go back, uh, you know, to the middle of last year, we were seeing re really strong uh, manufacturing production data really rivaling where we were in, in 2008. Um, that has pulled back, uh, obviously, more, more recently, but still at a relatively elevated level. And, and so, again, that's something I hear from some of our, our member companies. That's also borne out. Uh, I don't have a chart on it in here. But it's also borne out in the factory orders data. So for those of you who do follow me on Twitter, you saw that yesterday I tweeted out uh, overall manufacturing order demand, right? Uh, and, and while you're still seeing some year-over-year -year growth that is up modestly, about 4%, uh, since June, manufacturing demand is down around 2%, right? And so you've seen some, some pullbacks, especially in the second half of last year on that measure. The other number that I think is notable in those factory orders data, and it's certainly one that gives me some, com some comfort, uh, is that core capital goods spending uh, is, is essentially an all-time high still, right? So you're still seeing companies going out. Capital spending is still a strength in the overall economy. Companies are still looking towards that long-term picture of how can I, at the other side of whatever this uh, recession or downturn or soft landing or whatever it is, when you get to the side of that, how can we be positioned so that we can take advantage of that? Uh, likewise, kind of similarly, uh, manufacturing construction spending is also an all-time high, right? So again, both of those give me some 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 comfort that uh, hopefully moving forward we'll see some signs of strength there. <clears throat> and I forgot I did I did actually have the chart for core capital goods spending, and this this is what it, uh, what I was talking about. Um, when you look at the, at the larger economy, the larger global economy, uh, this is the top 10 markets that we sell into. This is the ordinal ranking of those markets for 2022. Uh, and encouragingly, we actually have expanding manufacturing activities in the top three markets that we sell into, uh, Canada, Mexico, and China. Um, just to kind of flip, flat, flip, uh, flip back to, to what this would look like in January. Uh, only one of these markets was growing in January, and that was Canada. So we've seen improvements in both Mexico and uh, China uh, in, in the February data, and we've seen kind of mixed numbers for, throughout the rest of the chart as well. Uh, still, seven of those markets are contracting, and, and overall, you still are seeing relatively weak manufacturing activity globally. You can see that the PMI number for the S&P global figure here is 50, so it's neutral, right? Uh, so that's actually progress from where we were. We had been contracting in several of the months before that. And so you're starting to see both in Europe and, 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 and in China uh, some signs of progress. Uh, the Chinese progress had everything to do with the fact that China dealt with zero COVID policies much of last year. Um, they have dealt with COVID more recently, and you're starting to see them emerge from, from that most recent bout of the pandemic and get out and about and and so you're seeing signs that the Chinese economy is starting to kind of emerge from, from really a really rough year last year. As goes China, so goes the rest of Asia. So look for some more blue in Asia, I would expect, uh, as well as the emerging markets uh, moving forward. The story about Europe, uh, obviously, we're going to continue to have uncertainties there with, with regard to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, w they've had a warmer winter, uh, and you're seeing growth there, and so far avoiding a recession uh, that we have been predicting uh, for, for quite some time. So they're actually seeing better data 
throughout Europe than we were expecting, although clear, clearly you're seeing uh, that they are still contracting overall. And so that's a little bit of, of, of uh, a mixed bag, but some progress from where we were, right? Uh, and as a result of some of that better data, you're trying to see some global uh, GDP estimates that are actually pulling in the right direction. So as I noted earlier, this is jobs week. So the focus uh, is jobs, jobs, jobs. We're gonna get new JOLTS data tomorrow. So that's job openings and labor turnover data. Uh, we get new figures for February on Friday. Uh, and it all comes after this really strong number that we had in January, right? So we had more than 500,000 non-farm payroll jobs added in January. There's clearly some seasonal adjustments that were part of that overall storyline, but still very robust job growth. Uh, and, 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 you know, the bottom line of all of that is that the unemployment rate uh, fell to 3.4%, uh, which was the lowest since May 1969. Uh, and uh, it's expected that when we get the numbers on Friday, that we're still going to see around 200,000 job openings or so uh, in February. And the unemployment rate will either stay at 3.4 or go to 3.5. So that's the consensus estimate. If by chance we were to fall to 3.3, uh, that would take us back to the lowest level since the 1950s. Um, I don't expect that to happen, but that's certainly something to watch for if we would, if that were to happen. Uh, moving forward, I do expect the labor market will cool over the coming months. I expect the labor, uh, the unemployment rate to drift to over four, maybe to four and a half, but probably more likely to drift to something over four. Uh, but again, uh, juxtapose that sentence, uh, four, four and a half, maybe even you know, some economists say five, but I, I don't, don't think we're going to get there uh, with the notion that there's still this worry out there about a recession, right? There's just a huge disconnect there with conversations about a recession with a four and a half percent or four percent unemployment rate. So the labor market continues to be one of the brighter spots out there. Um, one kind of asterisk next to that is that the labor force participation rate is well below where it was before the pandemic. It's a full percentage point lower than it was in February of 2020. Uh, we still have seen a lot of folks who have moved to the sidelines, uh, many of whom have not come back, right? And so this, this brings up the conversation of care is still is a big issue for a lot of manufacturers. I hear about childcare deserts around the country, so that certainly prevents a lot of parents from, from working or working as much. Uh, uh, you know, immigration plays into this overall conversation, uh, as 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 does just the you know the work life balance has shifted, right? And so, but many folks have just changed what their approach to uh, how they value life and what they should be doing and what their priorities are. So all those really have changed. Uh, and then, of course, the big head scratcher that's out there is we just have not seen men, particularly young men, come back in the labor market to the extent that we would have expected. And so, uh, is that the gig economy? Is that a number of other factors? certainly something that a lot of policymakers um, are trying to figure out. Uh, I do not expect us to get back to the pre-pandemic levels of labor force participation rate. And so that certainly will beg this issue of the skills gap continuing to be kind of one of those more structural issues that we'll be talking about for a while. Uh, on the manufacturing side, again, very solid manufacturing employment growth. Uh, we added almost 400,000 workers last year in the manufacturing sector. That was the best year for uh, employment growth in the sector since 1994. Uh, and a talking point that Joe Biden uses a lot that actually is one, actually our CEO uses all the time as well. We've added more jobs over the last two years than we added in any two year period since 1983 and 1984. So again, very solid manufacturing employment growth. We had a solid reading also for January and I, I still expect a positive reading uh, for February, probably in that you know, five, 10, 15,000 range is what I would expect for tomorrow, for, for Friday, for that overall figure. And, and the key fig, the key kind of uh, point to bring about, up about that is that uh, we now have almost 13 million workers in manufacturing. If we have a positive rating on Friday, that means we've gone over 13 million. Uh, and that's the highest level of employment in the sector that we've had since November 2008, right? So uh, who would have thought we'd be back to 13 million workers again in the sector? And so that certainly is a nice bright, bright spot uh, to really talk about. Yet, uh, the number that we're going to get tomorrow is obviously job openings. We'll have a lot of job openings in the sector. 764,000 job openings in the month of December, uh, averaging more than 840,000 over the last 12 months. So very elevated levels of overall job openings. Uh, we have seen an awful lot, a lot of churn in the labor market. 
that churn has cooled off a little bit. We've seen a little bit less quitting uh, than we had at this time last year, which were record highs, both for manufacturing uh, as well as the non-farm business side of the economy. Uh, but still, even with that, we had more than 4 million Americans quit their job in December, right? So still an awful lot of churn out there in the labor market. And the bottom line of all of that is that we have roughly 11 million job openings in the U.S. economy for not just manufacturing, for all sectors, uh, and 5.7 million unemployed Americans, right? So if it's almost a two-to-one ratio, right, of job openings to people who are actively looking for work. Uh, and this is why... Um, this is why, you know, quite frankly, uh, everyone is scrambling for talent. It's why, at least in my view, this is more of a structural issue that even when we get to the other side of whatever we're going through, downturn, soft landing, whatever, uh, we're still going to be talking about uh, where are the workers coming from, right? Uh, and, and, and the bottom line of that is that, uh, as I said kind of early on, many of our members have told me that they've had to raise wages several times over the last couple of years to feel like they were staying competitive with uh, the local market. Uh, and uh, what we saw he, in the overall average numbers for production workers and manufacturing in the January data was 5.3% year-over-year growth for, for average hourly earnings. Um, that was down from 5.9% this time last year, which was a 40-year high, but still very elevated levels of wage growth. Uh, this number is just shy of 26 bucks an hour, if you're going to attach a dollar figure to it. Um, we've seen faster wage growth uh, on a year-over-year -year basis in other sectors. And so you see that, again, when you're driving down the street and you see the job postings and signing bonuses in other sectors, um, especially in the service sector, hospitality, retail, et cetera, uh, you've seen a lot of, of, of wage growth there. And so even though manufacturers typically pay more than most of those sectors, you've seen that gap uh, narrow a little bit. So that has made a much more competitive landscape for manufacturing employment on the overall labor market. And the other comment to make here is, uh, is it as impressive as 5.3% is, um, the reality is that the consumer price index is still up by more than that, right? So in purchasing power terms, uh, the reality is that, uh, you know, we're getting a lot less with our dollars over that time period, which is a good segue to talk about inflation. This is a very timely topic. Uh, Jay Powell is testifying before the, on the Hill, both today and tomorrow. He did the Senate today, the House tomorrow. Uh, and so when, when, when he gives a speech uh, or gives a, a testimony like he did today, he, he says that uh, he wants the core inflation uh, to hover around 2% over the long term. And so that's the red line here. This is the personal consumption expenditures deflator, the price index for personal spending. Uh, and you can see that we're nowhere to near 2%. Um, uh, the challenge here uh, is that you're still seeing quite a bit of inflationary pressures in the system. Uh, and, and as a result, the Fed is being very aggressive, right? We, if you go back to, to this time last year, the Fed funds rate was effectively zero. Uh, today, it is a four and a half to five, uh, four and a half to 4.75 percent is the Fed funds rate. Uh, we expect that there will be 75 basis points more of growth, at least I expect right now, of 75 basis points more of growth between now and the summer. Um, that expectation had been a 25%, uh, 25 basis point increase at, in a couple of weeks at the March meeting for the Federal Open Market Committee, another 25 at their May meeting, and then another 25 at their June meeting. I think given Powell's testimony today, I think the betting odds are that that might get shifted up a little bit. And so it might be a 50 uh, at the March meeting and a 25 at the May meeting. Uh, I think a lot will hinge after that point on um, what does the data look like? Um, are you starting to see some progress on the inflation front? Are you starting to see some cooling in the overall labor market? Uh, and that will just dictate when the Fed stops raising rates. Uh, I do not see the Fed cutting rates uh, until sometime in 2024. So I think the market has more or less finally bought into that notion that um, rates are not coming down anytime soon. The other comment to make here is that you have started to see some moderation in the year-over-year -year numbers, right? Uh, we would expect these numbers will continue to moderate over the course of this year, especially as we get to more favorable comparison months. Uh, I would expect, especially as we get to the summer months, that you're gonna see those year-over-year -year numbers uh, fall pretty dramatically. Um, and you see that both for the PCE deflator, uh, for the producer price index, uh, as well as the consumer price index. Um, we'll be getting new CPI and PPI numbers next week. 
Um, uh, so even though you've seen that headline number pull back a little bit, I think, again, to my earlier comment, uh, the month over month numbers, right, um, as well as that kind of core inflationary levels, especially at the consumer level, uh, have been stubbornly high, right? Rent is still higher than we would like. Uh, and you're still seeing transportation services and food and some other solid areas where, where inflation continues to be pretty solid. So that is something to watch moving forward. When you, when you look at the overall GDP estimates um, for, for the current quarter, I have 1.8% up here. Actually, I could take that to two. Uh, I, I think uh, that we're gonna get somewhere in that range for the current quarter that we're currently in. Uh, and, and so we ended last year on a pretty solid note in, in the second half of the year, despite declining in the first half of the year for GDP. Uh, and, I, and I suspect as we move through the coming months, uh, you're still going to see a little bit slower activity. Uh, as you can see, I actually am a soft landing guy. I think we're going to have a soft landing, but I would expect that you're going to see some slower growth as the year wears on uh, and as uh, those uh, Federal Reserve rate hikes continue to take their toll a little bit. And so let's talk about the downside risks as well as the upside risks, and then uh, I will turn it over to Rob for the second half of this uh, program. So obviously the downside risks, uh, I already mentioned it, the Fed uh, is probably the biggest downside risk that's out there in terms of how, uh, how high do they have to take rates uh, given the long lags that are in monetary policy, uh, what damage has already been done and will be done by those higher rates. Uh, we've seen it already in housing and perhaps with the consumer side, uh, we'll, we're, where else will that slow down? Really? Uh, I don't know how the Russian invasion of Ukraine is going to end, so that's going to continue to be a level of uncertainty geopolitically, but also for, for Europe and the, Lord, the global economy. Uh, we have started to see signs of, of increased inventories, so that is, is, a, is a, a pretty strong red flag that we like to watch when it looks to uh, the business cycle. We've seen uh, rising inventory levels, especially in the retail side. But I also hear a little bit of extra inside as well. So that's something that I'm watching. I, you know, the, this notion that we've been really good for ourselves since last summer. Um, uh, I, my comment more recently is maybe we can finally start talking ourselves into a soft. Uh, maybe it works the other way as well. But there is that still uncertainty out there about whether we'll have a recession or not. And at least when you ask most manufacturers, should you even split in there? Job growth um, that really either prevents us from going or makes any that we have mild And then I, I put, kind of put you're going to see tailwinds in the economy from infrastructure investment, you know, the infrastructure package that passed last year, as well as a lot of reshoring and nearshoring that's taking place, semiconductor investments, et cetera. So all that's going to continue to provide some tailwinds to the economy this year. Well, that's an awful lot. Uh, and I took up almost a half an hour. So hope, sorry about that Rob, for taking up so much time. Uh, but uh, contact information, if you need me, uh, if you have any other questions that I didn't address, we'll be doing more Q&A obviously later in this session, but uh, for now, I'm going to turn it over to Rob. So thank you, Chad, and good afternoon to everybody who's dialing in. Sorry I'm not on web uh, camera at the moment. I am actually experiencing my own supply chain issue uh, brought on by some of the strikes uh, in France. So had some uh, changes to flight plans today, so I'm, I'm very sorry that I'm not with you uh, on, on webcam. But hello, and uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I wanted to follow on a little bit from what Chad spoke about and talk about some of the things that um, Sage can help you with from a technology point of view and how we can help you. So we're going to kind of go through why Sage, talk a little bit about some of the, the technology trends which are impacting manufacturers and then dive into one of our products, which is Sage X3. So um, if we go to the, the next slide, on the next slide, it, it really talks about who Sage are. And um, if you think about Sage, we are 
a well-known company in the manufacturing space. We have over 10,000 customers using our software solutions today to support manufacturing, assembly, and distribution operations across North America. As a company, we have over 30 years of domain and industry expertise supporting customers across that space. And I know my bio said over 20 years, it's probably getting close to, to 30 years for me as an individual. Um, we have a broad portfolio of solutions, which actually cater for manufacturers of a range of different sizes that are operating in different industries, whether you're, you're more focused on discrete manufacturing, process manufacturing, or whether you're a mixed mode manufacturer that's looking to expand. The other two rate, the other two things on the slide, which I, I wanted to call out, is that our customers are telling analysts in the industry that they love our software and they love the software capabilities. But let's park Sage for a little bit and talk a little bit about technology trends impacting manufacturers in general. So if we transition to the next slide, you'll see on this next slide that there are a number of technology trends, and and I. I I, I'm just going to go back to something that Chad mentioned, where he said that inventory levels are increasing. People are holding more inventory; they're they're keeping more in, on hand. And this is a, I mean, this just in case inventory trend is very much in in on vogue at the moment, and we're seeing that across the world with people not being confident in their supply chains. So. What are the sort of technology trends that are going to impact manufacturers and why are they so important? And I think there are a couple of those that stand out on the slide as well. That's quite obvious. Why, why, why are you talking to us about that? But I'm going to pick the first one, which is really about cloud computing. As we look to, uh, to the cloud, it provides us not with just the opportunity to host our software in the cloud, so it's not on our premises, which is great from a cost perspective and from a, um, a security of operations perspective, but it also ties in very nicely with this idea of remote operations. Being able to have people work in manufacturing anywhere, anytime, and ideally on any device that they want, that's going to appeal to some of the younger people looking to move into manufacturing. You heard Chad talk about how there are people in the workplace that are looking for that work-life balance, and maybe they don't have the ability to work the same uh, level of hours as they did. So cloud computing and the ability to access these operations remotely is going to be something that's going to become even more important as we look at a younger generation of workers coming into the workforce. Now, one of my favorite things that I love to talk about the most, which is often quite forgotten, is this idea of cybersecurity and data protection. As manufacturers, we're not exempt from looking after the data of our customers. With the, the data protection acts that are coming in across the globe, uh, we've seen California adopt uh, very strict rules around data protection. It's gonna become increasingly important for you to be able to manage your customer's data manage your supplier's data, but also manage the data of your employees and those that are trading with your business. This, in turn, also puts a huge emphasis on being able to manage cybersecurity, protecting that data, protecting credit card information, ensuring that you uh, are able to execute against that data with care and due diligence. That ties in, in a way, to what we're seeing around artificial intelligence, machine learning, and automation. Now, going forward, I think those are going to play an even stronger um, role in what businesses are doing. When we start to look at things like intelligent procurement solutions, that will be able to look at your inventory, look at trends over the last uh, few years. They'll be able to not just look at making proposals based on price or uh, delivery lead times, but they'll look at things like quality, carbon uh, accounting or carbon requirements because maybe you want to go towards a more green supply chain. Um, they'll be able to propose recommendations where you'll, instead of just having a two-dimensional matrix, we'll be looking at a three- or four-dimensional uh, window 
that'll allow us to evaluate multiple variables within the same model. And the human being will really be there to make the final decision point based on the recommendations. So technology is going to have a big part to play in how we go forward. And if we move to the next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the products that we have within Sage, which is Sage X3. It's a product which is near and dear to my heart and is used by about a thousand businesses across North America today, most of those in the manufacturing space. Now, really, our mission is to help manufacturing and distribution companies to transform their businesses using technology. We want to knock down some of these barriers that exist within organizations and really allow you and your business to thrive through the delivery of flexible solutions, which are intuitive and easy to use in that way built for manufacturers, and they can be tailored to your unique requirements. If we go to the next slide, we'll, talk, we'll see a little bit more about what we can actually offer customers that are using this capability. Of course, one of the things that stands out is our deep multi, multi, multi capabilities. So whether you're a single location or multiple manufacturing or distribution locations tied to, a, a, to your business, whether you have a complex supply chain that means that you have to interact with folks in the US, Canada, Mexico, possibly further ashore in Asia or in Europe, you have the ability to do that and manage that. We spoke a little bit about the importance of procurement and how that ties into how you manage your supply chain. And then of course, how you drive automation across the entire organization by removing those points of failure where people can uh, potentially enter data incorrectly or um, there aren't strict enough controls because of the way that their, uh, their, the current systems allow them to operate. So Sage X3 delivers all of this as well as the ability to effectively manage new product introduction, the ability to manage projects that might be uh, development projects, they may be investments in new manufacturing facilities or tooling, it may be looking at how you more effectively manage your supply chain. You can manage all of those projects, including projects that would allow you to implement or provision the goods that you're, that you're manufacturing and selling. But don't take my word for it. If we go to the next slide, you'll see a testimonial from one of our customers. And really what they're talking about is the fact that they've been able to be more agile because they have access to better uh, decision-making information. So they're able to get away from having stale reports and moving to real-time data, which has allowed them to be more uh, agile in the way that they run their business and take advantage of some of the things that are happening in the market. If we transition to the next slide, you'll see another quote from one of our customers there, which I think is quite intuitive, quite insightful, in that it was a great fit for them because it offered a web-based solution, which really makes it easy for them to have different sites around the world to work on the application in whichever It looks like we lost Rob for just a second there. Uh, hopefully we'll get him back shortly. Uh, but uh, assuming we do not, uh, this is Robert Schoenberger with Industry Week again. Uh, we can uh, start transitioning over to questions in just a moment here. Because uh, yes, it does look like we, we have lost Rob. Uh, wonderful technical difficulties from this connected world we live in these days. Uh, but uh, thank you for, for the presentation, the, the portion that you got through Rob. Uh, and thank you so much, Chad, for your presentation. A few of you have already submitted some questions, so we'll jump right in there. As a reminder, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. Uh, Chad, before we get into some of the audience questions, I just made some notes as you were speaking here uh, th throughout the presentation. Uh, you, you talked a lot about uh, the, uh, uh, the jobs picture, and one thing you mentioned was that the, the challenges 
really remain for quite are going to remain for a while. Are we seeing any easing from the manufacturing side from some of the job cuts we're seeing in service? I, I'm thinking especially about Amazon, the delivery companies and things like this that were so eating up that available labor uh, a few months ago or yeah. a year ago. So that's something we're going to be looking for in tomorrow's data to see if there are signs um, of some, some weakness there. Um, I mean, the reality is I suspect many of those folks in the tech sector are not staying unemployed long, right? Uh, they are very much in demand. Uh, and, and given the tightness of the labor market, um, uh, the, the reality is that, that, that uh, they, those folks are very much going to be wanted, right, in, in manufacturing and elsewhere. We have started to hear some signs um, that it's easier to hire. It doesn't mean it's, it's still not difficult to hire, but it's easier to hire than it was a few months ago. Right, and so that's a, again a sign that, that at least anecdotally there is some cooling that's taking place there. Um, there are some unique aspects to what's happening in tech versus uh, what's happening in manufacturing or other areas. A lot of cost cutting that's taking place, right? Um, but uh, as of right now, uh, we have not seen that spread uh, to the larger economy. Uh, overall, layoffs in manufacturing are, are have not really budged all that much, and so that's that's uh, at least a positive sign here in, in that kind of tight labor market space. Yeah, we're hearing similar things uh, in surveys we're doing and in conversations we're having with companies that uh, the the hiring picture is not moved to this positive, oh, it's easy to get people, but it's moved out of the negative into kind of that neutral territory, which is a much better place than we had been. It's less less uh, hard than it was before, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't mean it's not still hard, right? Right, let's get to the, the audience questions here. The first one is about the NEM Outlook uh, data that you're going to be sharing soon. So this may be premature, but is that data going to be available by sector or vertical uh, for, for example, electronics manufacturing, aerospace and defense, automotive? So we ask those questions um, about what sector you're in. Um, the reality is I don't really parse it out by those sectors just because we don't have the response rate to be able to say, well, this is what it is for metals. This is what it is for machinery or whatever. Um, but I do, I mean, I could certainly give those responses if someone's interested, but we don't really, because of response rates, I don't really dive into it in the, in the overall analysis as much as, as I could. Okay. And just a reminder, if you do have a question, please enter that into the ask a question window on the left side of your screen. And here's a very specific question about on the material side. What is the demand for steel, advanced high strength steel in the USA? Will the ESG push and the three steel plants going to EAF furnaces drive scrap prices higher? Uh, this is a feedstock for the cast iron foundry industry. We've seen mixed data on the metal side um, over the last couple of years. Um, we, uh, the, re the reality is, uh, I think that a strong China is going to mean you're going to see stronger commodity prices across the board. Um, there has been issues, obviously, with dumping that have kind of depressed some of those steel prices in the last few years. I'm sure you're <laughs> familiar with that, uh, Robert. Um, uh, but, but I do think that all commodity prices are going to start drifting a little bit higher, uh, really for a couple of reasons. Number one, I think the, the global economy is starting to show some signs of maybe some renewed strength. Uh, the other part is most commodities are priced in dollars, and you're see seeing the dollar rise a little bit, especially today, but it, over the last few weeks. So those will have some upward pressure on them. Um, on the ESG side, um, uh, certainly companies are continuing to look, uh, look at ESG differently, right? Uh, companies are looking at it from, both from a customer standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, because it makes sense to do so for the bottom line. And so you're seeing companies really move in a much more sustainable way, uh, and also looking to um, increase diversity in their workforces. And so that, I think, is a big issue. Uh, obviously, on the, on the flip side of that, the NAM is, is continuing to look at and comment on the reporting requirements that SEC is mandating uh, on that ESG movement, right, and, and trying to make sure that that is uh, something that's equitable and fair and, and not overly um, burdensome. We're seeing a lot of regulatory moves from Washington these days that are going to affect manufacturing uh, yes. in the near future. Uh, obviously, the ESG reporting requirements, the, uh, uh, the, the, the some of the th moves from the National Labor Relations Board that are uh, favoring uh, employees fairly heavily, uh, even this Federal Trade Commission ban on uh, 
non-disclosure agreements and uh, non-disparagement agreements and non-compete clauses. Uh, these are all going to have some impacts on on hiring going forward, I would imagine. And you've seen the NAM take active roles in commenting on each of those that you just listed, um, right? I think we're certainly following that very closely. Uh, you know, looking at a much more pro-regulatory, much more aggressive regulatory environment over the over the next couple of years. Um, obviously, we're going to see what we can try to achieve on a legislative front. But given the mixed, uh, you know, Congress that you have, uh, I think the administration is going to continue to go the regulatory route on a number of fronts, and we're going to continue to push back where appropriate. I don't see any more questions in the queue right now. If you do have a question, please uh, submit it right away and we will get to that. Uh, again, thank you very much to to Rob and, uh, fr from Sage. I'm sorry you uh, uh, we, we lost you on the technical side. Uh, we are seeing a lot of interest uh, right now in those sorts of solutions in the uh, on the software side because of this uh, the, the, the workforce issue. So many companies we talk to are talking more about investing in automation, investing in uh, efficiency and better software, better systems, uh, because it is so difficult to find the, the bulk of people uh, needed. Uh, a question that has come up from several people is, uh, can you download the slides? Uh, we, uh, I, I don't believe those are available, but if you go ahead and send that request in, we can forward that on to the various speakers and they may be able to make those available to you later. Yes, uh, but thank you, you can for that. email me. You can email me and I will send them to you. Right, and everyone who has submitted from, those from questions, office, those emails yeah. will, yeah, those, those will flow to chat and he'll be able to respond to you and send those over. Yeah. So thank you for that, uh, for that question. And I am not seeing any more questions. So with that, uh, I, again, thank you so much, Chad. That was an excellent presentation and thank you, Rob. I'm sorry, sorry we lost you, uh, but it, Great uh, conversation, great uh, wrap up of what's going on in the economy. Oh, I'm sorry, one last one for Ch Chad. What uh, What is going on with reshoring, nearshoring of manufacturing in North America? You mentioned that briefly in your presentation, kind of on that uh, uh, tail, uh, sure. headwinds, tailwinds section. What do you see going on there? Yeah, I mean, we clearly are seeing signs of that happening. I mean, the reality is lots of supply chain disruptions over the last couple of years, freight costs were soaring. Um, just, you know, and even before that, quite frankly, we had the trade war, we had a number of other geopolitical events that I think really have honed in on the need to just wholesale reevaluate where you're getting your inputs from, right? And I think that in that conversation, uh, North America is looking more attractive, right? I think, uh, but, but certainly from the NAM standpoint, we're seeing a lot more investment in the US as well, right? So. We've seen record foreign direct investment in manufacturing. Uh, anecdotally, we continue to hear about new investments that are taking place, not just in chips or autos, but kind of in other sectors as well. So I think that that is a trend that is gonna continue uh, and hopefully one that uh, continues to provide a nice boost for manufacturing activity in the US. Yeah, we, we've talked a lot, this about, a lot in our, our office here about uh, there have been so many supply chain disruptions over the years that everyone predicted this is going to be the end. People are going to move production back to the U.S. because we don't want to risk what happens after another Fukushima earthquake. We don't want to risk what's going to happen after another uh, disaster in Europe, uh, we, we, what's going on geopolitically with the original invasion of the Crimea from Russia uh, going on uh, 14 years ago. Uh, none of those had the sticking power of COVID and just this demonstration that the entire global supply chain could break down so completely. Uh, so it's, it's uh, it, I, we're, we're definitely hearing that, at least anecdotally, that uh, people who thought they could get through and just wait out the supply chain are now having to rethink that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, everyone's also just looking at the geopolitical situation. Um, the companies might end up producing more locally. Right, where the you know, produce where you sell, right? And so that that bigger storyline out there about globalization and how globalization will sh shift over the coming years, I think, is one that is being had uh, in in corporate suites around the country. So, we're at, well, most of the questions coming in are still about those slides. Again, if you've submitted that question, uh, your email will be sent on to Chad, and he'll be able to send you those slides. He will get all those emails. Uh, so he'll be able to respond to you and get those slides to you. Thank everyone for uh, listening today. It was an excellent presentation. I'd like to thank our speakers, Chad Moutre and Rob Sinfield, and our sponsor, Sage. 
Now be happy of industry week. Have a productive remainder of your day.